Hello, I'm uh, Paul Beckwith, and uh, this is just a quick video to talk about, uh, you know, the importance of beavers in the ecosystem. And uh, they've actually been around in some regions for up to seven and a half thousand years doing their beaver stuff. Um, and they have a huge uh, positive influence on the ecosystem. So as more and more people are talking about rewilding and nature-based uh, solutions, ways to store more carbon, etc. You know, beavers and uh, other uh, critters are very important parts of the system that are often overlooked. So this video is all about uh, the beavers and their ecosystems and um, especially beavers in the Tetons. There you go for millennia. And, uh, you know, there's also, I'll cover uh, worms in another uh, video soon because worms are they play a key part in breaking down silica based materials rocks and things for weathering and of course we know that weathering is a way that co2 is removed from the atmosphere long term worms actually really accelerate the process okay so these are agu papers the american geophysical union which occurred last week um, in uh, san francisco for the week it's one of the largest earth science, well, it is the largest earth science conference in the world. Um, it's held every year in the US. Uh, I went to it a number of years ago in New Orleans. I'll probably go to a conference uh, at some point again, uh, depending on where it is. Um, there were about 27,000 scientists in attendance. So it's a very, very big science conference. Um, it's not just climate change, probably most of the papers are on climate these days, uh, but it's volcanoes, it's landslides, it's, uh, you know, stuff on the oceans, all uh, the earth sciences. Uh, there is a European version, the, Amer the European Geophysical Union, which probably is worth attending um, at some point, probably <laughs> just as important or more important than, than the cops that are going on. Okay, so this was presented um, for that conference. So what they did is they analyzed lake sediment in the Grand Teton National Park, I think it's Wyoming, um, to piece together the ecosystem history. Um, and there's implications for um, rewilding and land management today. Okay, so this is an adult and juvenile beaver uh, munch on vegetation near Windrose, Oregon. Okay, so I've actually, I don't know if you've ever run into beavers yourself on the, um, out in the wild. Um, and <laughs> it reminds me, there, there was a Canadian magazine, I don't know, 100 years old, it was called The Beaver. And uh, they changed their name, you know, it was all about um, nature. Anyway, they, they, they changed their name uh, because uh, they were getting the wrong type of, uh, you know, when, it, when things became digital and they had their website, they were getting too many, um, too many redirections to their website that were undesirable, shall we say. So, so they changed their name. But anyway, so beavers have lived in the Grand Teton National Park for thousands of years. So they analyzed the ancient DNA that's found in the sediments of the lake beds. So, you know, beavers modify their ecosystems to an extent surpassed only by humans. They're real landscape architects. I mean, we all know about the dams that they build, but they can also build canals connecting bodies of water. Um, so the beavers in this region, they may have kept the plant and animal communities in the Teton stable over millennia as the climate was changing. So they build dams, we all know that. They also dig canals, most people don't realize that, that transform waterways and ecosystems. They're, so their engineering basically creates new habitats for other plants and animals. So they're often used um, as a restoration tool, you know, beaver rewilding. So, so it's important to know, you know, the more we know about them and what they've done in the past, the more we can understand their impacts on ecosystems now and moving into the future. So where we should put them in the future, for example, to help the ecosystem. Because they were wiped out, as you know. 
for the most part. So land managers look to the historical record to determine which ecosystems may benefit from beavers, but records are often incomplete. We don't know much about where or how beavers influenced ecosystems in North America before the fur trade, because the fur trade wiped out much of the continent's beaver population in the 1700s and 1800s. They were just trapped, almost to extirpated uh, from, from North America. Um, okay, so we can use this information about their deep past to understand where beavers were in the past so we can know where we should put them in the future. Um, according to this evolutionary biologist and doctoral candidate at the University of California, Nev Baker, lead author of this new study. Okay, so they basically, so all living things shed DNA into the environment, okay, um, through dead skin cells, hair, excrement, and other bodily fluids. Even millions of years later, scientists can collect this environmental DNA, this eDNA, and determine which species left it behind. Lake environments are especially great for finding ancient eDNA because they're shielded from the sun damage, right? Ultraviolet rays can damage and destroy DNA. And also microbial activity can break down and destroy DNA. So basically in the sediments of lakes, uh, they're shielded from these, these, these um, problems, these things that break down DNA. So this, in searching for ancient beaver DNA, the team took sediment core samples from three lakes in the Grand Teton National Park. Uh, okay, so one of the lakes, Lake Solitude, was used as a control. Because it's a high elevation lake, it's an alpine lake, it's fed by snow melt. The research didn't expect to see evidence of beavers there in the sediments, and they didn't find any ancient beaver DNA in that lake. But they did find ancient DNA, beaver DNA, in the sediments of the two other lakes that were low, lower elevations, uh, Taggart Lake and Jenny Lake. So in both lakes, they detected ancient beaver DNA in the sediment from 7,250 years ago. Beavers have been there an awful long time. They analyzed the, the layers of the sediment and they could find out uh, what periods of time if any, the beavers weren't in the lake. So basically, the, the Taggart Lake sediment cores showed the beavers were there continuously, at least to their resolution of every 500 years, since about 5,000 years ago. Ancient be beaver DNA detections in Jenny Lake were less continuous, uh, but I think they, they, they were older. They went back to the 7,250 years. Okay, so what it shows, this data, is that beavers were present during a regional shift to more wintertime precipitation and the growth of more water-loving trees such as poplars and willows. Okay, so, the, the, so as climate changed, as the population shifted, the beavers were there and would adapt to those sort of shifts and they'd give the ecosystem resilient. So here, here's an image. There's some beaver dams. You can see beavers are they're currently residents of Grand Teton National Park. New research shows they've been in the area for thousands of years. So this is actually a fascinating study, first of its kind for, for beavers. This idea of eDNA is a fairly new technique just in the last few years. Um, I learned a lot about it when I attended the Biodiversity Conference in Montreal uh, a year ago in, in December. Although beavers might be responsible for the shift in vegetation, it's possible that they showed up in the region because the climate shift influenced what was growing. So what came first, the beaver or the poplar, right? That's the chicken and egg question. That's posed by Emily Fairfax, an eco-hydrologist at the University of Minnesota. Okay, so these results were presented December 14th, uh, about a week ago at the AGU annual meeting 2023 in San Francisco, as I mentioned. Okay, so reconstructing the dam constructors. So this new approach to piecing together beaver habitats could be useful elsewhere. So in California, they have a beaver restoration program created this year, and it's working 
to establish the animals in some ecosystems in California to promote the return and persistence of other important species. But before they can be introduced, policies in the California State Department of Fish and Wildlife, they require program staff to demonstrate that the area is within the beaver's native range, i.e. that the beavers will live and survive and thrive in that region because they did in the past. So now they can use the DNA to prove that conclusively. Okay, so given the implications of the fur trade and the extirpation, okay, that's a local extinction. It's not the extinction of a species, but it's the removal of a species from a certain region. So the extirpation of beavers from the fur trade, um, from any watersheds, um, we know that their current range does not reflect their historical native range. Um, so the ancient DNA evidence is scientific evidence that, that shows uh, the area had beavers before, therefore it's, it, beavers will thrive there probably now. So looking for ancient beaver DNA can help answer questions about how ancient novel ecosystems arose too. So the existence of beavers in a past ecosystem could explain so like confusing shifts in carbon storage in soils or perplexing pollen records. It's a missing piece that we can characterize. So, you know, beavers are remaking microbial ecosystems in the Arctic, Western United States, mapping beaver dams with machine learning, right? There's lots of stuff. There's a whole new beaver book actually, uh, which I'll have to uh, get and have, have a look at. Um, okay, a couple other things on Beavers, I just Googled uh, beaver restoration um, in Google images and you get loads of uh, places. I know they're doing some rewilding in parts of the UK, um, in many, in some European countries, basically all over. Um, yeah, I was, I was hiking one day and uh, could smell this awful smell and uh, went around a corner in the trail and lo and behold, there was a huge beaver um, working away just to the side of the trail and boy did it stink and boy was it large so you can I didn't realize that they they smelled quite like that but anyway there's lots of work um, do, on restoration rewilding and stuff and beavers beavers and you know wolves are also very important as an apex predator okay so um, I had a look at this guy here this is this is a good website called this is restoration of beavers in Mount Hood in the U.S. Uh, it's a beaver habitat restoration project because in the 1800s they were hunted to near extinction by the European fur trade. Populations in low-lying areas have begun to recover, but they continue to be killed in large numbers by federal and state wildlife agencies. So we need healthier populations. Um, and these beaver ponds, they recharge aquifers. They do all kinds of positive things for the environment. The presence of beavers can improve water quality, mitigate the effects of climate change, restore habitat for many animal species, including migratory fish um, like salmon and steelhead. Okay, it's definitely a keystone species. It's very important for the ecology of the whole system. So how do they change their environment well they make uh they change their habitats to make suitable homes for themselves they use mud silt and sticks to create dams and build lodges they create ponds which can increase the surface area of water several hundred times over what would be there without the beaver this increases the riparian you know rivers and lakes areas and wetlands and from streams and it can restore these areas increase the complexity of these systems they become huge carbon sinks so here's an example of a dam, beaver dams, altering the geomorphology of a re region. So you've got this erosion and you've got this narrow incised stream um, in the first place. And you have, you know, beavers building a dam here. High stream power, you know, on, when, the, when the stream is flooding, you get high water flow. It can blow out the dam. It can, it can erode on the surfaces and make it wider and then the, the the beavers build more dams here and this wider stream has lower energy of the water right because the water uh you know has more volume over which to flow more area over which to flow so the water flow rate obviously the water flow rate is very high in a flood here very low here 
with a wider stream, lower energy, so the beavers can build wider and more stable dams. And then you get beaver ponds forming behind the dams. And the beaver ponds rapidly fill with sediment and are temporarily abandoned. Okay, so you get sediments and marshlands there. The sediment promotes riparian growth, growth along rivers. This process repeats, right? Flooding again, depositing silt, the dam comes up. So if you dig down under a beaver dam, these beavers that have been there thousands of years, they should dig down and excavate underneath dams and they'll probably find, you know, dam, another dam, another dam. It's turtles all the way down, basically. Dams all the way down. Okay, so this process repeats and the level comes up and eventually the incised stream is reconnected to its former floodplain. It's on the same level as the former floodplain and the um, stream ecosystem develops a high level of complexity. So over time, you can have an environment like this becoming an environment like this, which stores an enormous amount of carbon. Okay, so beavers, uh, you know, they make changes that are uh, good for erosion control, right? The area with all the roots and all the trees and stuff, the erosion is gonna be much less. Whereas here, the erosion cut this deep channel through the landscape. So beaver ponds, they expand the riparian, which is river and stream vegetation. They expand the water available for wetland and the plants, riparian plants. So it increases the vegetation along stream banks, protects against erosion, leads to better water quality for human use, better habitat for the salmon and steelhead fish that migrate in those uh, streams. They improve the stream temperatures. Um, there's thousands of stream miles um, listed as water quality is impaired by, by higher temperatures. The rise in water tables in beaver dominated meadows results in increased groundwater contributions. Um, so you get deeper pond water depths, so you get a decrease in stream temperatures. Okay, um, habitat creation, they create habitat, the ponds and meadows created by beavers enhances habitat for game species like ducks, deer, and elk. They improve migratory bird habitats. Expanded beaver ponds, wetlands, wet meadows, and structurally complex and diverse riparian habitat. It increases food sources, habitat resting areas, rearing areas, including snags for cavity nesting uh, species. So places where birds can nest um, so threatened birds uh, come back. Uh, salmon recovery, it helps in the, in, in the abundance of salmon and steelhead that are adversely affected by dams, over harvest, hatchery practices, habitat degradation, and climate change. Um, uh, it improves the fish habitats, improves the rearing habitats, rearing for uh, the, the young. Okay, so so beavers are very important for climate change mitigation. Okay, so climate change is severely altering precipitation and temperature patterns. For example, in the, this is a Pacific Northwest project. More flood events, drought events, river flow is greatly shifted to rain-driven flows, more or less snow-driven, snow-melt-driven flows. So less summertime flows, and it's a concern for drinking water and for salmon. And of course, these changes are most prominent in the highest elevation watersheds, um, where flows are currently most dependent on winter snow accumulation. Okay, so this is an ordinary creek. Here's the creek here, and this is the water table, the stream effect on water table. If you have a beaver dam creek, of course, the water level comes up and extends over a lot more of the land area by orders of magnitude. Um, and the water underneath, uh, the water table is different. Okay, so it's, it's very, very healthy for ecosystems. It improves, uh, beavers mitigate the effects of climate change. They improve water security, quality of water for municipal ranching and agricultural users. They increase temporary surface water and groundwater in the headwaters, resulting in more water being more slowly and sustainably released. They stabilize river flows during drought and damaging flood events. They recharge aquifers 
offset the impacts of drought, decreases the frequency and magnitudes of downstream flooding. Improved water quality occurs, cooler stream temperatures, less sediment, because the beaver ponds and dams act as a giant water filter, resulting in cleaner water downstream. Okay, so beavers are, they do all kinds of stuff. It creates carbon capture and storage areas. So if you want to talk about carbon capture and storage, uh, just introduce beavers into the areas. Okay, the wetlands and wet meadows extract carbon from the air. It's stored in the roots and decaying matter below the ground and in the abundant riparian vegetation above the ground. The beaver ponds also capture and store carbon as dead vegetation is submerged under the water. Right, so this natural process of carbon capture and storage related to wetlands, wet meadows and ponds directly addresses climate change and is currently an underutilized climate change response strategy. Okay, uh, you won't see people with signs, uh, we don't want beavers, we don't want beavers, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it's capturing, it, it's mitigation, it's climate mitigation, it's carbon capture and storage. Who can be against having more beavers? Everybody loves beavers. Uh, creates wildfire safe zones for wildlife and livestock, right? When wildfire goes through the area, if there's all this water on the ground and riparian and, you know, lakes and ponds and enhanced watershed, um, those are somewhat fire resistant, right? So an increase in the size, severity and frequency of wildfires is expected and seen with climate change so if you increase the abundant size and distribution of wetlands, wet meadows and ponds, then you get these safe zones that it creates these safe zones during wildfires for the wildlife and livestock to retreat to. And, and the, they can also recover much more quickly post fire because there's an abundant amount of water and many of the riparian plants are fire adapted and respond favorably to the disturbance. Okay, so there's all kinds of different reasons why uh, the, uh, the beavers are vital. Okay, so there's lots of these projects going on. I just showed you one example. Okay, now this is the, um, this is the abstract uh, from the paper at the EGU. So let's just have a look at what it says here. Okay, so basically beaver-based restorations gaining momentum as a low cost conservation and climate adaptation um, solution. But relatively little is known about how beavers in North America were tempor temporarily and spatially distributed prior to their near extirpation by the European American fur trade. I mean, beaver pelts were very, very valuable um, and they were basically massacred the beavers uh, so people could make money accessing their pelts, fur coats, and all the rest of it. Um, so understanding the beaver ecosystem engineering, how it alters the local environment on long, beyond decadal timescales is limited. So they use sedimentary ancient DNA analysis, it's SEDA DNA techniques to investigate the history of beaver occupancy in the three lakes in the Grand Teton National Park, Wyoming over the past 10,000 years um, and the interactions with the local plant community. So they did a species specific qPCR assay. This is a uh, polymeric chain reaction uh, DNA technique. They found the dynamic history of beaver presence in the lower two uh, terminal lakes, no history of beaver occupation at the higher elevation, the headwater lake. Um, beavers were first detected in the lake 7,250 years ago. They've been continuously in Taggart Lake since 5,000 years ago, um, but detection is more variable in the, lar lar in, in the larger lake. Yeah, I'm, I'll be a minute, just five. No, 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 actually, you get mad when we're late. Just, yeah, I'm getting in the car. Um, apparently I have to go. Um, so basically, this is a very fascinating new technique and it's being used to reconstruct the past beaver occupancy dynamics in lakes and finding, you know, that they're vital for ecosystems, uh, ecosystem restoration. So this is a fascinating, uh, fascinating paper. 
And um, I just want to say um, this is another paper which I will talk about soon on worms for very how important worms are for weathering um, the earth soils. Thanks for listening. Uh, please consider going to my website, paulbeckwith.net, to um, donate to my PayPal to support my research and videos as I join the dots on abrupt climate system change. Thanks again, and uh, bye for now.